Hi everybody, my name is Dave Vellante and welcome to this special CUBE community event. You know, customers are on a digital journey. They're trying to transform themselves into a digital business. What's the difference between a business and a digital business? Well, we think it's the way in which they use data. So we're here with a company, Infinidat, who's all about using data at multi-petabyte scale. We, ha we have news, we have announcements, we're going to drill down with subject matter experts, and we're going to start with Brian Carmody, who's the Chief Technology Officer of Infinidat. Brian, it's good to see you again. Good to see you too, Dave, and I, I can't believe it's been a year. It has been a year and, and since we last sat down. If you had to summarize, Brian, the last 12 months in one word, what would it be? Uh, how about two words? Insane growth. <laughs> Insane growth, okay. Yes, yes. Talk about that. Yeah, so as of this morning at least, Infinidat has a hair over 4.6 exabytes of customer data under management, which is just insanely cool. And uh, I'm not sure if I counted all of the zeros properly, but it looks like it's around 180 trillion IOs served to happy customers so far, so, so, as of this morning. So mind-boggling numbers. So let me ask you a question. Are these, uh, is this growth coming from sort of traditional workloads? Is it, is it new workloads? Is it a mix? Oh, that's a great question. So, you know, in, in early in the Infinidat ramp, our early traction was with, you know, core banking and mm -hmm. transaction processing applications. It was all about consolidation and you know, replacing rows of VMAXs with a, with a single floor tile of Infinibox. But in the past year, virtually all of our growth has been an expansion outside of that core. And it's a movement into greenfield applications. So basically, obviously our, you know, our customers are going into hardcore digital transformation. And this kind of changes the, um, the types of workloads that, we, that, that we're looking at and that we're supporting, but it also changes the value proposition. Consolidation and stuff like that is all about the bottom line. It's about making storage more efficient. But once we get into the digital transformation in these greenfield applications, which is where all of our, most of our new growth is, it's actually all about using your digital infrastructure as a revenue generating machine for opening up new markets, new opportunities, new applications, et cetera. So when people talk about cloud native, that would be an example, cl losing, using cloud native uh, tool chains, that's what's happening on your systems, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I can give you some examples. So like recently I, uh, I spent a day with a group of engineers that are working with autonomous vehicle sensor data. So this is telemetry coming off of self-driving cars. And they're working with these ridiculously large, like multi-petabyte data sets. And the purpose of this system is to make the vehicles more smarter and, and more resistance to uh, collisions mm -hmm. and ultimately you know, more, more safe. Um, a little bit before that, uh, me and a bunch of other people from the team spent a day with uh, another partner. They're also working with sensor data, but they're doing uh, biometrics off of wearables. So they've perfected an algorithm that can, in real time, detect a heart attack from your pulse and will immediately dispatch an ambulance to your geolocation of where the uh, where ho hopefully your arm is still connected to your, you know, to your body, <laughs> and immediately send your electronic medical health records to that nearest hospital. And only then do you get a video call on your phone from a doctor who says, hey, are you sitting down? You're going to be fine. You're having a heart attack. And an ambulance is going to be there in two minutes. And the whole purpose of this is just to shave pre precious minutes off of that critical period of getting a person who's having a heart attack to get them the medical care yeah, they need. Yeah, I'd say that's a non-traditional workload, I mean, <laughs> and the impact is saving lives. That, that's awesome. Now, let's talk a little bit about sort of your journey. You know, our friends at Gartner, they do these magic quadrants. You know, a lot of people don't like them. I happen to think they're, they're, they're quite useful uh, as a guidepost. You guys have always been strong on the sort of vision, and you, you, you've, you've been executing. 
Where are you today in, in that quadrant? Yeah, so we were, it's an extreme honor. We, Gartner uh, elevated us into the leaders quadrant uh, last year. Um, so uh, customers take that very, very seriously. And you know, the ability to execute access uh, is you know, what Gartner says, it's are you influencing the market and are you causing the incumbents to change their strategies? And with our disruptive pricing, with our reliability guarantees, our SLAs and stuff like that, Gardner felt like we met the criteria and it's just, it's a huge honor and we absolutely have our customers to thank for that because the Magic Quadrant isn't about what you tell Gartner, it's about what your customers tell Gartner. So yeah, congratulations we're very, very thankful for and that. And I yeah. know the Peer Insight, you guys have done very well on that also. Yeah. I want you to talk about the team, you're growing. And you, you, to grow, you got to bring on good people. You've added some folks. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of Gartner, um, we got uh, Stan Zaphos, who recently uh, joined. He's going to be running product marketing for us, working with Doc. Um, so, you know, he's a legend in the industry. So we're delighted to, uh, to have him on board. Um, also, uh, Steiny came over from Pure to uh, join us as our field CTO. Um, another legend who needs no introduction. Uh, so really, really happy about that. But also, it's not just, those are guys that customers see, but we're also experiencing this on the engineering side. So we, for example, we recently uh, were very amused to realize that there are now more EMC fellows working at Infinidat, if you count Moshe, more in EMC fellows working at Infinidat than working at Dell EMC, which is just you know a humorous kind of funny, funny thing. So you know as as the business has grown and has gotten momentum, um, you know, just like I, we're continuously amazed by the creativity and the things our customers are doing with data every day, I am continuously amazed and humbled by the caliber of people that I get to work with every day. That's so awesome. um, we're, we're really, really happy about it. All right, well, thank you for the recap of the, of, yeah. of the past year. Let's get into sort of some of the announcements today, and I want to talk about the vision. So you have this Infinidat Elastic Data Fabric. I'm interested in, in what that is, but I'm also, frankly, even more interested in, in why. What's the why behind that? Sure, sure. So Elastic Data Fabric is Infinidat's roadmap and our, our shared vision with customers for the future of enterprise storage. And the why is because customers demanded it. Um, if we kind of look at, you know, kind of what's happening in the industry and the way that real customers are dealing with data right now, they have some of their data and some of their workloads are running in across public clouds. Some of them are in managed service providers, some of them are SaaSes, and then they have on-premises storage arrays. And Elastic Data Fabric is Infinidat's solution that glues all of that together. It turns it into a single platform that spans on-premises, colo, Infinidat-powered managed service providers, Google, Amazon, and Azure. And it glues it into a single platform for running workloads. Um, so, you know, over the course of this present of, of these presentations, we're going to drill down into some of the enabling technologies that make this possible. But the net net is that it is a brand new next generation data plane for, uh, let's say, for example, within an, uh, a, a customer data center. It allows customers to cluster multiple InfiniBoxes together into what we call availability zones, and then manage that as a single entity. And that, sc and that scales from a petabyte up to an exabyte of capacity per data center. And typically a customer would have one availability zone per data center, and then one availability zone that can span multiple clouds. So that's the data plane. The control plane is the ability to manage all of this no matter where the data lives, no matter where the workload is or needs to be, and to manage it over a, with a single pane of glass. And those are the kind of uh, 
pieces of enabling technology that we're going to unpack in the technical sessions. So two questions on that, if I sure. So you got the, the data plane, the control plane. If if I want to plug in to some other control plane, you know, VMware control plane, for instance, your API based architecture allows me to do that. Is that? Oh correct? yeah, it's application aware. So, uh, for instance, if you're uh, running a, a VMware environment, or if you're running a Kubernetes environment, it seamlessly integrates into that, and you manage it from a single API endpoint. And it's elastic, it scales up and down, uh, and it's, it's infinite and immortal. And probably the biggest problem that this solves for customers is it makes data migrations obsolete. Mm -hmm. It gives us the ability to decouple the data life cycle from the hardware refresh life cycle, which is a game changer for customers. I think you just answered my second question, which what's, what makes this unique? And that's at least one aspect of it. Yeah, I mean, that's the data migrations are the bane of customers' existence. And the larger the customer is, the more filer and array sprawl they have, the more of a data migration headache they have. So when we kicked this project off five years ago, our call to action the first, the kernel of an idea that became Elastic Data Fabric was find a way to make it so that the next generation of infrastructure engineers that are graduated from college right now will never know what a data migration is. To make it a, a, a story that old men in our industry talk about. Well, that's huge because it is the, yeah. the bane of customers' existence. It's very expensive, a minimum $50,000 per migration in many, many months. Brian, thanks so much for kicking this off. Yeah, we got a lot of ground to cover. Um, and so we're going to get into it now. We're going to get into the news. We're going to double click on some of the technologies and architectures. We're going to hear from customers. And then it's your turn. We're going to jump into the crowd chat and hear from you. So keep it right there. We'll be right back right after this short break. with Dr. Rico, the CMO of Infinidat. We're going to talk about agility and manage manageability. Good to see you, Doc. Good to see you again, Dave. All right, let's start in reverse order. Let's start with manageability. What's your story there? Sure, I'm happy to do that. You know, Dave, we get great feedback from our customers on how simple and easy our systems are to manage. We have products like Infinimetrics, which give them a lot of insights into the system. We have APIs, very simple and easy to use. But our customers keep asking for more insights into their environment, leveraging the analytics that we already do. Now, you've also heard just now about our Elastic Data Fabric, which is our vision, Infinidat's vision for the data center, not just of today, but into the future. And our first instantiation of that vision and answering those customer responses is a new cloud-based platform, initially to provide some better monitoring and analytics, but then your window into data migrations, auto-provisioning, storage availability zones, and really your whole customer experience with Infinidat. So my understanding is this is a, a SaaS solution, is that correct? It is, it's a secure multi-site solution. So in other words, all of your Infinidat systems, wherever they are uh, around the world, all visible through a single pane of glass. Um, but the cloud-based system gives us a lot of great power too. It gives us the agility to provide faster development and rapid enhancement based on feedback and, and feature requests. It also then provides you customizable dashboards into your system dashboards that, that we can create very rapidly, giving you advisors and insights into a variety of different things. And we have lots of customers who are already engaged in using this. So uh, I'm interested in this advisors and insights. I, I, my understanding is you guys got a data lake in the back end, you're mining that yeah. data, performing analytics on it. What, what kinds of benefits do customers get out of that? Well, they can search into things like abandoned volumes within their system, tracking the growth of their storage environment, um, configuration errors like asymmetrics, ports and paths, or even just performance behaviors like abnormal latencies or bandwidth patterns. So we say ab abandoned volumes, we're talking about like reclaiming wasted space. Absolutely. Uh, be able to reuse it. I mean, people in the old days have done that because a log structured file and they, they had to do it for performance, but you're doing it to give back money to the, to the customers, exactly. is that right? It's exactly right. You know, customers very often get requests from business units to spin up additional volume sets for mm -hmm. whether it be a test environment or some, some special application that they're running for some period of time. 
And then when they do, when they spin down the, the environment, they sometimes leave the data set there thinking that they might need it again in the not too distant future. And then it just sort of dies on the vine. It sits there taking up space and it's never used again. So we can give them insights into when the last time things were accessed, how often it's accessed, what the IO patterns are, how many copies there might be with snapshots and things like that. You mentioned strong customer feedback. Everybody says they get great customer feedback, but, but you've been with a lot of companies. How, how is this different and, and what specifically is that feedback? Yeah, the analytics and insights are, are, are very unique. This is exactly what customers have been asking for from other vendors. Nobody does it. And, you know, we're hearing such great stories about the impact on their costs, like the capacity utilization, reclaiming all that abandoned capacity and being able to put new workloads and grow their environment without having to pay any additional costs is, is exciting to them. Identifying and correcting configuration issues, getting ahead of performance problems before they occur. Our customers are already saving time and money by leveraging this in our, in our environment. All right, let's pivot to agility. Uh, sure. You got Flex, what's your story there? What is Flex? Well, Dave, you know, imagine a world, if you will, if you didn't have to worry about hardware anymore. Right? It, it, it sounds like a science fiction story, but it's not. Sounds like cloud. It sounds like cloud. <laughs> and, and people have been migrating to the cloud. And, and in the public cloud environment, we have a solution that we talked to about a year ago called Nutrix Cloud, providing a sovereign-based storage solution so that you can get the resilience and the performance of InfiniBox or InfiniGuard in your system today. But people want that experience on-premises. So for the on-premise experience, we're announcing InfiniBox Flex and InfiniGuard Flex, an environment where you don't have to worry about the hardware. You manage your data, we'll manage the hardware. And you get to pay for what you use as you need it. You can scale up and down. We'll guarantee the availability, 100% availability. And with this environment, you'll get free hardware for life. Okay, well, a lot of questions. So, so um, sure. this sounds like your on-prem cloud, right? You're bringing that cloud experience to the data wherever it lives. You say I can scale up and scale down. How does that work? You're you're over provisioning, or and you're not charging me for what I don't use. Can you give us some details? There? Well, just like with uh, with an InfiniBox, we're going to try to provide the, the customer with the InfiniBox that they need, not just for today, but for tomorrow. We're going to work with the customer to look into the future and try to determine what are their performance requirements and capacity requirements over time. The customer will have the ability to manage the data configuration and the allocation of the storage and add or remove storage as they need it. As they need it, as they scale up, and we'll, we'll build them based on a daily average, just like the cloud experience. And if, as they reduce, same thing. It will adjust the daily average and they'll get billed accordingly. So am I right, the customer makes some minimum commitment Yes. And, and then if they go over that, you'll charge them for it. If they don't, then you won't charge them for it. Is that correct? If they go over it, we'll charge them for the period that they go over. If they continue to use it forever, we'll charge them that. If they reduce it back, then we'll, we'll charge them the reduced amount. So that gives them the flexibility there and the, the agility. Okay, 100% availability. What, what's behind that? Can you, you know, some color? We have a seven nines reliability metric that we, that we manage to on a day-to-day -day basis. We have customers who've been running systems for years without any noticeable downtime. And when you have seven nines, that's 3.16 seconds of availability per year, right? The, the life cycle of an IO timeout is much longer than that. So effectively, from the, the customer's application perspective, it's 100% available. We're willing to put our money where our mouth is. So if, if you experience downtime that's, the, that's caused by our system at any time during that monthly period, you get the next month for free for the entire capacity. Okay, so that's a guarantee that you're making. That's a guarantee. Okay, read the fine print, but it sounds like the fine print is just what you said. It's it pretty straightforward. Uh, free hardware for life, free free like a puppy? <laughs> <laughs> no, free like in free. <laughs> okay. Free meaning you're paying for the service, we're providing the capacity for you to put your data, and every three years we will refresh that entire system with new hardware. And that's the minimum is three years. If you prefer, because of your business practices, to change that cycle, we'll work with you to find the time that makes the most sense. So I can do four years or five years if I want. You can do four years or five years. You can do three years and three months. And you'll get the latest and greatest hardware. We'll also, by the way, provide the data migration services, which is part of this cloud vision. So you're not going to have to do any of the work. You're not going to have to pay 
for additional capital expense so that you have two sets of hardware on the floor for six months to a year while you do migration and work it in your schedules. We'll do that entire thing transparently for you in your environment and completely non-disruptive to you. So you guys are all about petabyte scale, you know, hard enterprise problems. So this isn't you know a mom and pop sort of small business nope. solution. Where do you see this playing? Obviously service providers are gonna eat this stuff up. Yep. Well, give us some- Yeah, you know, there. service providers is a great opportunity for this. It's also a wonderful opportunity for Infiniverse. But all you know, any large scale environment, this should be a shoe in. And you know what? If even if you're in a small scale environment that has a need where you you want to maintain that environment on premises, you're small scale. You want to take advantage of your data more. You know you're going to grow your environment, uh, but you're not quite sure how you're going to do it, or you have these sporadic workloads. Perhaps uh, in you know in the finance industry, you know we're 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 in tax season right now. Taxes just ended, uh, you know, half a month ago, right? Uh, there are plenty of businesses who need additional capacity for maybe four months of the year, so they can scale up for those four months and then scale back down. Okay, give us the bottom line on the customer impact. So the customer impact is really all about greater agility, the ability to provide that capacity in a flexible model without big impact to their, to their overall budget over the course of the year. All right, Doc, thank you very much. Appreciate your time and the insight. It's my pleasure, Dave. All right, let's hear from the customer, and we'll be right back right after this short break. Michael Gray is here. He's the Chief Technology Officer of Boston-based Thrive. Michael, good to see you. Thanks hey, for coming on. Glad to be here. So tell us about Thrive. What are you guys all about? Uh, you know, Thrive started uh, almost 20 years ago as a traditional managed service provider, but really in the past four to five years transformed into a next generation managed service provider. Primarily now we're focusing on cybersecurity, cloud hosting, and uh, uh, public cloud hosting as well as disaster recovery. To me, uh, and, and this is something that's primary uh, to Thrive's focus is uh, application enablement. We're an application enablement company. So if your application is best run in Azure, uh, then, then we want to put it there. Uh, a lot of times we'll find that um, just due to business problems or legacy technologies, we have to build private clouds uh, or even for security reasons, we want to build private cloud or purely just because we're running into a lot of public cloud refugees. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they didn't realize a lot of the uh, maybe incidental fees along the way actually climbed up to be a fairly big budget number. So, you know, we want to really look at uh, people's applications and enable them to be highly high performance, but also highly secure. So yep. I'm curious as to when you brought in Infinidat, yep. what the business impact was, mm -hmm. you know, economically. Yep. And there's, yep. there's other sort yep. of non-TCO factors yep. that I yep. want to explore. Yeah. So was it the labor cost that got reduced? Did you redeploy those resources? Well, or was it well, actually well, the hardware? Or? First and foremost, um, and you know, this is going back many years, but um, and, and I think I would say this is true for any uh, data center cloud provider. The minute the phone rings and someone says, my storage is slow, we're losing money. Okay, because we've had to pick up the phone and someone needs to address that. Um, we have eliminated uh, all storage performance uh, help desk issues. It's now one thing I don't need to think about anymore. Uh, we have, we know that we can rely on our performance and we know we don't need to worry about that on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is not in question. Uh, now, the other thing is really as we started to expand our Infinidat footprint geographically, we suddenly started to realize not only do we have this great foundation built, but we can leverage an investment we made to do things that we couldn't do before. Uh, maybe we could do them, but they required uh, another piece of technology. Maybe we could do them or they uh, required some more licensing, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but really when we started the standardization, we did it for operational efficiency reasons, uh, and then suddenly realized that we had other opportunities here. And, and I have to hand it to Infinidat, they're actually the ones that helped us craft this story. Um, not only is this just a solid foundation, but it's something you can build on top of. Has that been your experience, that it's, it's sort of reduced or eliminated traditional storage bottlenecks? Oh, absolutely. And you know, um, I mentioned before that this is, uh, storage performance has now become an afterthought to me. Uh, you know, and a little bit the way we look at our storage platform is we, from a performance standpoint, not a capacity standpoint, we can throw whatever we want uh, at the Infinidat. Uh, and sort of the running joke internally is it will just smile and say, is that all you got? You mean like mixed workloads or you don't have to sort of tune each array for a particular workload? Yeah, yeah. Like and, and, you know, I can imagine as someone that might be listening to what I'm saying, well, hey, come on, you, you know, 
they can't really be that good. And I'm I'm telling you from seeing it day to day, uh, again, you can just throw the workloads at it and it will do what it says it does. Um, you don't see that every day. Now, as far as capacity goes, uh, you know, they uh, there's this capacity on demand model, which, uh, you know, we're a huge fan of. Um, they also have some other models, the flex model, which is uh, very useful for uh, budgeting purposes. Um, what I will tell you is, you have to sacrifice uh, at least one floor tile for an Infinidat. It's very off-putting uh, at first on day one, and I remember my reaction, but again, as I was saying earlier, when you start peeling back the pieces of the technology and why these things are and the different flexibility uh, on the financial side, uh, you realize th this actually isn't uh, a downside, it's an upside. We're gonna talk performance with Craig Hebert, who's vice president at Infinidat. He focuses on strategic accounts. Craig, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. All right, so let's talk performance. Everybody talks about performance. They have their bench marketing. Mm -hmm. Everybody's throwing Flash at the problem. You guys, you use Flash, but you didn't hop on that all Flash bandwagon. Why and how are you different? It's a great question. We get it a lot with our customers. So um, we innovated. Um, we spent over five years looking at the big picture, what the box would need today, what it would need in the future, and how would we arrive there by doing it economically. And so, as you said, we use a small amount of flash. That's a, a small percentage, two, three, four percent of the of the total box. But we do it by having a foundation that nobody else has. Instead of throwing hardware uh, at the solution, we have uh, some some special mechanisms that nobody else has. We have a try. Or it's a, a multi-value structure that allows us to dy dynamically trace and track all the IOs that come into the box. We ship intelligence. Everybody else ships dumb blocks of data. And so their only course of action to adopt new strategies is to bolt on the latest and, and greatest media. I've had a lot of experience at other companies where they have tried to shoehorn in uh, new techniques, whether it be a NAS blade into an existing storage box or whether it be thin provisioning after the fact. And things that are, are done um, uh, it, sort of like after the design is done never, never pan out very well. And the beauty with Infinibox is that all our protocols work the same way. Uh, iSCSI, NAS block, it, it is all structured the same way. And that makes performance equal over all those protocols. And it makes it also easy to manage by the same API. Structure. So you're claiming that you can get equivalent or better performance with a combination of flash and spinning disk yep. than your competitors who are all flash. Can you kind of Absolutely. add some color to that? Absolutely. So we use DRAM. All of our writes uh, are ingested into the box through DRAM. Uh, we have 130 microsecond latency, which is actually the, 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 the lowest speed that fiber channel can attain. And so we're able to do things very, very quickly. It's 800 times faster than NAND, which is what our competitors are using. We have no RAID structure um, on the SSD at all. So as, as things flow out of DRAM and go onto the SSD, our SSD is faster than everybody else's, even though we use the same. So there's a mechanism there that we that we optimize. Uh, we write in, in large sequential blocks to the SSD, so the wear rate isn't the same as what our, our competitors are using. So everything we do is with an optimization, both for the present data and also the recall. And one of the things that culminates in a massive success for us, how we have those three tiers of data, but how we're able to outperform all flash arrays is that we do something, we hold data in cache for a massive amount of time. The average uh, uh, write latency in, a, in something like a VMAX is about 13 seconds, the maximum is 28. Uh, we hold things for an astounding five minutes. And what that allows us to do is put profiles around things and remove randomness. Randomness is something that's plagued data storage vendors for years, whether it's random writes or random reads. If you can remove that randomness, then you can write out to what are the slowest spinning disks out there, the nearline SAS drives, but they're the fastest disks for sequential read. So if everything you write out is sequential, you can use the lowest uh, uh, cost disk, the, the nearline SAS disk, and, and maximize the performance. And it's that technology, it's that uh, those patterns, 138 patterns, that allow us to do all of these steps in the process, which augment our ability to serve the customer's data at a, at a vastly reduced price. So your secret sauce is architecture intelligence, as you call it, and Absolutely. then you're able to to provide lower cost media. Yep. Uh, and of course, if Flash were lower cost, you'd be able to use that. There's no reason that you couldn't. Is that correct? We could, but we wouldn't gain anything from it. A lot of customers say to us, why aren't you using more Flash? Why don't you build an all Flash array? Why don't you use NVMe? And we are actually, uh, the, the the next version of the, the software will ship NVMe capable as well as storage class memory. Why we don't do it is because we don't need it. Uh, customers have often said to us, why don't you use 16 gig fiber channel or 32? And and we haven't made that move because we don't we don't move bottlenecks. We, we give customers a solution, which is an end-to-end -end appliance. And so when we refresh the, 
um, the software stack and we change the config with that. We make sure that the fiber channel is upgraded. We make sure that the throughput, the InfiniBand, everything comes with an uplift. So there's not just one single area of a bottleneck. We could use uh, more SSD, but it would just be more money and we, we wouldn't be able to uh, give you any more performance than we are today. So you have some hard news today. Uh, yep. Tell us about that. Yeah, I will. So, so we are a software company and, and going back to the Gen 1, I was here on day one when we started selling in the United States. Um, when the first box was released, it was 300,000 IOPS. Moshe said he wanted a million IOPS without changing the, the platform. We got up to about 900,000. That's a massive increase by just software tweaks. And so what we do is, is once the product has gone through its, its second year, we go back and we optimize and we reevaluate, which is what we did in the fall of 2018. And we were able to give a 30% uplift to our existing customers just with software tweaks in, 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 in that area. So now we move to another config where we will introduce the 16, the 32 gig uh, fiber channel cards, NVMe over fabric and storage class memory and all those things that are up and coming. But we don't need to utilize those until the price point drops. Right now, if we did that, we'd just be like everybody else and we, we, we'd be driving up the price point. We're making the box ready to adapt those when the price point becomes acceptable to our customers. Okay, last question. Uh, you spend a lot of time with strategic accounts, yep. financial services, healthcare, insurance. What are some of the most pressing problems that you're hearing from them that you guys are helping them solve? It's a great question. So we see people with sprawl, uh, managing many, many arrays. Um, one of our competitors, uh, for instance, for Splunk, they'll give you one array uh, with one interface for the hot indexes, uh, another mid-tier array with another interface for the warm indexes. Of yeah, <laughs> and, and then they'll give you a, a bunch of cold now storage on the back end with another disparate interface. All three of them are managed separately and you can't even control them from the same API. So what customers like about us, and just, just Splunk is just one example, so we come in with one 19-inch uh, uh, array in, in one rack. The hot indexes are handled by the DRAM, the warm indexes are handled by the SSD, and the cold data is right there on the, the nearline SAS drives. So they see from us this powerful, all-encompassing solution that's better, faster, and cheaper. We sell on real, not effective. And so when, when encryption and things like this get turned on, the price point doesn't go up with Infinidat customers. They already know what they're buying. Everything else is just cream. And it's massive for economical reasons as well as technological reasons. Excellent, Craig, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back right after this short break. We're back with Ken Steinhardt, who's the field CTO at Infinidet. Ken, good to see you again. Great to see you, Dave. It's been a long while. It sure has. Thanks for coming back on theCUBE here. So, you have the customer perspective. You've worked with a lot of customers. You've been a customer. Availability, high availability, obviously important, especially in the context of storage. What's Infinidat's story there? Well, high availability has been a cornerstone for Infinidat, obviously, from the beginning, and it's really driven some pretty amazing things, not the least of which has been seven nines of availability proven by the product. What's new and different now is we are extending that with the ability to do active, active clustering, and it's the real deal. We're talking about the ability to have the exact same volume now at synchronous distances, presenting itself to both sites as if it were just a single volume. Now this is technology that's based upon the existing synchronous replication and InfiniSnap technology that Infinis InfiniDAT has already had. And this is going to provide always on continuous operation, even able to be resilient against site failures, component failures, storage failures, server failures, whatever, to be able to provide true zero RPO and true zero RTO at distance. And it's able to provide the ability to provide consistency also by using a very lightweight witness, which presents itself as a third completely separate fault domain to be able to see both sites to ensure the integrity of information while being able to read and write simultaneously at two sites to what logically looks like one single volume. This is going to be supported with all the major cluster software and server environments, and it's incredibly easy to deploy. So that's really the first point associated with so this. So let me, let me follow up on that. So a lot of people talk about active a lot, of, a lot of companies. How is this specifically different? It's different in that it is going to be able to now change the economics first and foremost. Up until now, typically people have had to trade off between RPO, RTO, and cost. And usually you can get two of the three to be positive, but not all three. It's sort of like if you buy a car. RPO equates to the quality of the solution. RTO equates to the speed or time. Cost is cost. If you buy a car, if it's good and it's fast, it won't be cheap. 
If it's good and it's cheap, it won't be fast. And if it's fast and it's cheap, it won't be good. So we're able to break that paradigm for the first time here. And we're going to be able to now take the economics of multi-site disaster tolerant cluster type solutions and do it at costs that are probably comparable to what most people would do for just a single site implementation. And your secret sauce there is the architecture, it's the software behind it. Oh, well, it's actually, it's a key point. The software is standard and included, and it's all about the software. This is an extension of the existing synchronous replication technology that Infinidat has had. Standard and included, no additional costs, no separate quirky gateways or anything. Being able to now have one single volume logically present to two different sites in real time continuously for high availability. So what's the customer impact? Um, the customer impact is continuous operation at economics that are comparable to what single site solutions have typically looked like. And that's just going to be huge. We see this as possibly bringing multi-site disaster tolerance and active-active clustering to people that have never been able to afford it or didn't think they could afford it previously. And that really brings us to the third part of this. The last piece is that when you take an architecture such as Infinidat with Infinibox that has been able to demonstrate demonstrate seven nines of availability, and now you can couple that across at distance, in synchronous distances to two data centers or two completely different sites, we are now able to offer a 100% uptime guarantee, something that statistically hasn't really been particularly practical in the past for a vendor to talk about, but we're now able to do it because of the technology that this architecture affords our customers. So, so guarantee as in when I read the fine print, what, what does it say? No, obviously we'll give the opportunity for our customers to read the fine print, but basically it's saying that we're gonna stand behind this product relative to its ability to deliver for them. And um, obviously, this is something customers we think are going to be very, very excited about. Ken, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Appreciate it. Pleasure is mine, Dave, as always. Great to see you. Great to see you. Okay, thank you for watching. Keep it right there. We'll be right back right after this short break. Okay, we're back for the wrap up with Brian Carmody. Brian, let's geek out a little bit. Um, you guys are technologists. Let's start with the software tech that we heard about today. What are the takeaways? Sure, so yeah, there's a huge amount of, uh, of content in here and software is, is most of it. Um, so we have, first is R5. This is the latest software release for Infinibox. It improves performance, it improves availability with Active Active, and it introduces non-disruptive data mobility, which is a game changer for uh, for customers for uh, manageability and agility. Also, as part of that, uh, we have the, the availability of Infiniverse, which is our cloud-based analytics and monitoring platform for uh, for Infinidat products, but it's also the next generation control plane that we're building. Um, and, and when we talk about our roadmap, it's going to grow into a lot more than it is today. Um, so it's a very strategic product for us. But yeah, that's the the net net on software. Okay, so but the software has to run on some underlying hardware. So what are the innovations <laughs> there? Yeah, so I'm not sure if I call them innovations. I mean, in our model, hardware is boring and commoditized and really all the important stuff happens in software. But we have listened, customers have asked us for, and we are delivering 16 gigabit fiber channel as a standard option. And we're also giving a option for 32 gig fiber channel and for 25 gig ethernet. Um, 25 gig ethernet, which is again, things that uh, customers are asking for and we've delivered. And also while we're on the topic of, uh, of, of protocols and stuff like that, we're also demonstrating our uh, NVMe over fabrics implementation, which is deployed with select customers right now. It is the world's fastest NVMe over fabrics implementation. It is a round trip latency of 52 microseconds, which is half the time round trip for us is half the time that it takes a NAND flash cell to recall its data, forgetting about the software stack of the round trip. Um, that's going to be available in the future for all of our customers, general availability via a software only update. Ah, that's incredible. Uh, yeah. All right. So net out what that means for, for the roadmap. Oh, sure. So basically with our roadmap is we're laying out 
uh, a very ambitious vision for the next 18 months of how to give customers ultimately what they are, are, are screaming for, which is help us evolve our on-premises storage from old school storage arrays and turn them into elastic data center scale clouds in my own data centers. And then come up and then give us an easy, seamless way to integrate that into our public cloud and our off-premises technologies. And that's where we're gonna be starting today and taking us out the next 18 months. Well, we covered a lot of ground today. Um, uh, pretty remarkable. Congratulations on, on the announcements. We covered all the abilities, even performance ability. I'll throw that one in there. So uh, so thank you for that. Um, final word. I, the final word is probably just a message to our customers to say thank you and for, for trusting us with, uh, with, with, with your data. Uh, we take that covenant very seriously and we hope that you, with all of this uh, work that we've done, that you feel we're delivering on us, delivering on our promise of value to help them enable competitive advantage and do it at multi-petabyte scale. Great. All right. Thank you, Brian. And thank you. Now it's your turn. Hop into the crowd chat. We've got some questions for you. You can ask questions of the experts that are on the call. Thanks, everybody, for watching. This is Dave Vellante signing out from theCUBE.